Hi there, I'm Nafisa Salatic. This is Across the Balkans. And this week, we are expanding our definition of the region to take you to the northeastern edge of the Balkan Peninsula. We are in Moldova, the least visited country in Europe. And within its borders lies a largely unknown autonomous region called Gagosia. It's home to the Gagos people. They are a small Turkic minority group and speak a language close to the Turkish. Their rights and autonomy are protected by Moldova's constitution. But their tiny region is caught between Russia, the EU and Turkey, all vying for influence. Andrew Hopkins went to this remote corner of the world to find out why. More than a thousand kilometers from the Turkish capital, across three international borders into the former Soviet Union, Anna Statova is welcoming guests to her hotel and restaurant in a language that wouldn't sound out of place in Turkey. Her business is called Gagos Sofrasa, which means Gagos dining table. She started selling food to passing motorists in the 1990s and has now had visitors from 40 countries in the past three years. The Gagos people were enticed here 200 years ago by Russia from what is now modern-day Bulgaria, but was then part of the Ottoman Empire. They were promised exemptions from taxes and military service. Today, the autonomous territorial unit of Gagosia is a largely rural area with rolling hills and a population of about 160,000. There are vineyards and fields full of sunflowers and corn. To outsiders, the situation in Gagosia can seem a little complicated. It's one of the few remaining areas in Eastern Europe where you can still see a statue of Lenin here on Lenin Street. And just behind, you can see the top of the Russian Orthodox Church. Most Gagos people are Christian. But if you look at the local newspaper, Anna Suzu, it's written in a language most Turkish speakers can recognize. A defining feature of the past five years has been increasing trade with Turkey. It's gone up more than 60%. The Turkish president visited three years ago. He opened a hospital treatment center named after a Nobel Prize winning Turkish scientist. Now a Turkish funded stadium with a capacity of 5,000 is nearing completion. An education center named after President Erdogan is planned and there's a retirement home for the elderly named after his wife. But links with Turkey predate the current president. The Mustafa Kemal Atatürk Library has been here more than 20 years. The founder of the Turkish Republic himself sent dozens of Turkish teachers here in the 1930s. Inside are close to 10,000 books, a mix of Turkish history and literature, with some in the Gagos language including a section on a hero of the Gagos cause, the priest Mihail Çakir. Burada olmasının birkaç nedeni var. Bunların başında eee aslında Gagavuzlar bir Türk boyu. Eee yani biz akrabayız, onlarla kardeşiz. Eee bu birinci etken. Bir de Türkiye malumunuz eee nerede böyle eee zor durumda yaşayan bir bölgede işte insanlar varsa Onların etnik kimliğine, dinine falan bakmadan yardıma koşan bir yapıya sahiptir. Bunu hemen hemen tüm dünyada görebilirsiniz. Across the road from the library is the main local government building, where I meet the governor of Gagosia. Irina Vilar was first elected in 2015 with the backing of Moldova's Socialist Party. She was then re-elected four years later with more than 90% of the vote and welcomes Turkey's investments in a country that's often labeled Europe's poorest. Благодаря этим отношениям нам удалось реализовать очень много серьёзных проектов на территории нашей автономии, и это проекты, которые были направлены на развитие образования, на развитие культуры, 
А за несколько лет нам удалось построить новые сады, детские сады, реорганизовать наши школы. Очень скоро мы сдадим спортивный, крупный спортивный комплекс, который строит правительство Турции. And most people watch Russian TV. A referendum was held seven years ago, which the central government rejected. People overwhelmingly voted in favor of closer economic relations with Russia and its allies, and against closer ties with the EU. But now Moldova has a new prime minister, Natalia Gavrilita, and a pro-EU central government following an election in July. Political analyst Sergei Manastirli says Gagor's people view Turkish investments as gifts, but to the central government, they are beneficial for a different reason. Sometimes uh, Moldovan government uh, they uh, accept uh, these uh, Turkish investments in uh, Gagosia uh, as they accept it as, uh, as a good, because uh, they think it uh, changes uh, it changes disposition in the uh, region and uh, it lowers Russian influence on the region on the Gagosian mines, uh, and they hope to use it as. Um, More autonomy has meant you can now see signs in both Russian and Gagos. This one in the park in the region's capital, Comrat, gives a warning about domestic violence. Gagos language lessons are also given in schools. This doesn't look much like Turkey with all these Soviet-era housing blocks, but some of the people living inside will remember a time when they could only use the Gagos language with their close family and friends. Now the authorities are trying to change that by reviving the language and its culture. Outside the Culture House too, where the governor's orchestra is practicing, the sign is also written in Gagos, although the music doesn't always have to be traditional. The orchestra's leader, Yuri Taranenko, moved to Gagosia in the 1980s. He remembers a time before Beyoncé and before Moldovan independence in 1991 and says there are now more bands and cultural diversity. Я считаю, что это большие шаги, шаги в области культуры, а также и в экономике вижу и, и в структуре развития этого региона. Change is also being brought about by cash from the EU and other European institutions. This new junction is being funded by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It's also being supervised by a Turkish company. The governor of Gagosia believes she can balance all the competing interests in her region, including the population's sympathies to Russia and antipathy to the EU. Я по должности являюсь членом правительства Республики Молдова и являюсь руководителем этой автономии и считаю нужным и правильным работать над тем, чтобы качество жизни у наших жителей было хорошим, чтобы отношения между нашими партнерами были хорошими. И если у меня есть такая возможность, если у меня есть возможность повлиять на улучшение взаимоотношений с руководством Турции, с руководством России, с лидерами европейских государств, я считаю нужным и правильным это делать. The Gagos are just one large minority in Moldova's diverse population. Other parts of the country have tried to break away. But so far, autonomy and foreign investment here seems to have meant more integration and the revival of the Gagos identity. Andrew Hopkins, Gagosia, Moldova. As we've been covering here on Across the Balkans, denying the Srebrenica genocide has recently been made illegal in several countries in the region. 
Now we are seeing this principle spread to the world online as well. Twitter and YouTube, owned by Google, have confirmed that they will be removing content that denies genocide from their platforms. It was a response to a direct request from the Institute for Research of Genocide Canada. Both tech companies say they have a clear policy that sanctions all hate speech, and that includes the denial of the Srebrenica genocide. The director of the institute said the move serves as justice for the victims of Europe's worst atrocity since Second the World War and is a victory in the fight against genocide deniers. According to the Institute, most of the Srebrenica genocide denial comes from Serbia, from Bosnia's Serb-run entity Republika Srpska, Russia and France. The Secretary General of the Institute for the Research of Genocide Canada is here with us now. Alena Demirovic, thanks so much for being with us on Across the Balkans. Um, Alena, what is the significance of this move by Twitter and YouTube? And especially, how significant is this for the victims and their families? Uh, let me just start by saying that if you allow racism and discrimination space to grow, it will metastasize, as is a phenomenally resilient cancer in our society. Um, social media companies are unable to moderate content. Actually, they, many times they choose not to um, moderate that content. In our case, uh, we were specific on what type of post shall be removed and offered to assist. We presented substantial um, evidence of the genocide in Srebrenica and recently have informed these social media companies um, of the law that um, High Representative Isco um, uh, put out. Uh, what we heard from companies was that we were sure that necessary actions will be taken by their companies to filter out the posts about denial of the genocide in Srebrenica. Um, how significant for families, it is very important for families to have peace and closure on this. And as long as the online um, uh, social media uh, companies are putting out these kind of um, posts, um, they will experience pain and, and suffer. So right. this is what our became about. I'd like to read a part of the letter written by Emir Ramic, the director of your institute, Alena, to the CEO of YouTube. Uh, now, those who deny the genocide in Srebrenica are humiliating the victims through your YouTube platform, inflicting pain and suffering on the survivors of the genocide, which in return encourages the genocide deniers and future possible creators and perpetrators of the genocide. Now, uh, give us more details about that letter. What was requested by the Institute for Research of Genocide Canada, and how did the YouTube respond? Sure. Um, for many years, we have witnessed YouTube platform being used for continuous organ organized and systematic denial of Srebrenica genocide. So um, our institute, the Institute for the Research of Genocide in Canada, on behalf of hundreds of thousands of victims of genocide in Srebrenica, we requested from YouTube to consider making change to their company's rules on hate speech and ban all contact from its platform, which denies and distorts the truth about genocide in Srebrenica. Um, so what we got in response from YouTube was that we were sure that necessary actions will be taken by their companies to filter out the posts about denial of genocide in Srebrenica. Um, is that going to be 100% accurate that they're going to do it, uh, the time will tell, but we did start the action, so we'll see how it goes. Right, and Twitter says their hate policy prohibits a wide range uh, of behavior. Uh, this includes targeting individuals with offensive intentions, calling for violent events, the type of violence where protected categories of people have been victims or where attempts are made to deny or minimize such events. Also, uh, Twitter says they have a strong policy in cases of glorifying violence and that they are taking measures against such content and behavior that try to glorify or praise violence and genocide. So what exactly will be removed from the platforms? And have you requested Facebook to do the same? Will they follow? So uh, in, to answer your question, what will be removed, uh, let's just go back a few years. Um, a few years ago, discriminatory racist posts were rarely removed by social media companies. And yes, even today, we're still witnessing those posts, however, significantly less. In July of 2020, the Holocaust survivors around the world urged Facebook um, um, 
President Mark Zuckerberg to take action to remove denial of the Nazi genocide from the social media. So in October of 2020, Facebook shifted their policy on handling hate speech and Holocaust denial, saying that they would not prohibit any content that denies or the source the Holocaust. So what we did, we reviewed this policy and we actually altered it so that it would ref uh, uh, reflect the Srebrenica genocide and have asked Facebook to uh, to do such a thing. Uh, however, um, you know, to edit their current policy and include this, uh, and uh, include the denial of Srebrenica genocide. Uh, what we ran into with Facebook specifically was that our first uh, attempt contacting them was unsuccessful because uh, Facebook has this um, a Balkan team that actually reviews the posts from the Balkans and puts out whatever they seem, you know, um, okay to go out. However, these people were actually, <laughs> um, they were supporting the genocide deniers of our criminals and they were, um, they, they got a hold of our request and that kind of went vague. We, we never um, heard anything back from them. So after we spoke to other social media, um, companies and had uh, their response, we made an, a second attempt. But this time we didn't go through the Balkan team. We actually went directly to the Facebook headquarters and uh, and uh, put in our request, which went to their policymakers. So now this is in works. We have spoken to a few people and we're hoping that Facebook would actually follow uh, YouTube and other social media platforms. Right, it's interesting to see that, you know, people who are actually denying the genocide, the international court verdicts, working for Facebook and being allowed to choose what to post, isn't it? Yes, it is, actually. That's not our only problem in the Balkans. We do have in Bosnia, actually, specifically at some of the universities, infiltration where uh, the people who work there are actually uh, gen they deny the genocide in Srebrenica and actually are putting this into the young Bosnian people had and um, th so this is an issue that we're trying to see where it's going to be taken you know long not right now but there is a, a bigger problem than just the Facebook infiltration so we're working on that as well. Right um, your research also showed that the most of the genocide denial comes from Serbia from the Republika Srpska that's an entity in Bosnia run by uh, Serbs uh, also from Russia and what's very interesting France uh, why do you think we are seeing a rise in genocide denial in these countries specifically? Uh, first of all, let me start by saying that, you know, Bosniaks are native people in Bosnia and Herzegovina and have a rich history that many of our neighbors are jealous of. <laughs> so this, in, uh, because of this, we have the historical negotiationism, uh, uh, a case where our history is being falsified or disordered. So from this, we can come to the conclusion that Critical re-examination of historical fact or historical urbanism uh, <laughs> fact is necessary tool to bring the truth out. Our mission wasn't easy, uh, as many of those support the war criminals and their actions are working for the, these specific uh, social media companies uh, and are in charge of control of what goes out there. As their supporters of genocide doors and war criminals, majority of times these posts are left unattended and shared between like-minded. So it goes on and on and on, never ending. Uh, we also need to mention the Serbian diaspora uh, is a large, uh, a very large diaspora in the countries that you have mentioned, but also in North America. And they play a significant role in supporting the genocide deniers and the political system responsible for the genocide in Srebrenica. We, we need to remember that the hate speech that spreads online doesn't just stay online. Many times we have seen the connections between the prevalence of racist speech on social media platforms and hate crimes in the area. Right. Uh, for example, I'm just going to actually give you a few examples that happened recently. Just yesterday, we could see the junior football team in Serbia provoking another junior team from Novi Pazar, a city in Serbia and Sanjak region, by singing anti-Muslim songs. Another case that we recently heard about is also a Serb war criminal hiding in Serbia and that country protecting him, even though he's on an Interpol list. Right. So these are the cases where reflect, uh, re uh, reflexive interaction between online and offline racism reinforce each other. Kids hear from the adults, see it on the internet, and where adults are encouraged by the government to spread the hate. To conclude, in an off uh, offline world where uh, there are consequences to racism, discriminatory behavior, but in online spaces there are no limits and people become radicalized without any boundaries. The right. failure to stop such action is 
a cost of human life. So this, right. This uh, is a it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem, and we are seeing a, a rise of genocide denial, a, a rise of hate speech, the rise of far right uh, across the Balkans, and social media has been used as a tool uh, for this. Um, Obviously, the countries in the region somehow fail to provide strategies to combat uh, this. Uh, what would be um, your advice to them and how to, how to prevent this? Because we are seeing far-right gatherings organized by Facebook groups. Um, our recommendation, I mean, uh, when it comes to the question of, you know, posting on uh, social media, uh, you know, First of all, you have to be aware of, you know, what are you posting, who you're posting it for, what are you saying, you know. Um, but again, uh, social media is a, a type of weapon. People post, you know, whatever they want, especially the hate speech, this discriminatory. What social media companies need to do is actually have these policy policies, which they do, but they haven't implemented them. They had promised, you know, to the to the American Senate that they will do this, and you know, promised to the many victims of genocides around the world. However, they haven't stepped up to the plate yet. So we're really pushing, you know, for this to come into the action because, you know, if somebody is a war criminal, and you know, we have international courts say they have, they are, they need to pay for, you know, for their consequences. They can't just, you know, live freely, be a a, a doctor, and you know have a nice life and our victims, you know, being underground or not even knowing where their bones are. So this this is an unfair situation for now. Right, uh, exactly. And um, it's interesting. I want to talk about the timing uh, for this uh, move by Google. Also, uh, it comes um, after the former high representative, Valentin Insko, as you were mentioning, imposed a law that forbids uh, denying of the genocide um, that we were waiting uh, in the region for a long time. The victims' families were asking for this for years. Um, and your institute also uh, was trying to make some changes for a long, long time. Why do you think all this is happening now? Well, what, what really is important to mention here is that the law uh, that the law has been imposed. Maybe a bit late, but nevertheless, it's here to stay. So it's it's a tool that we really need to uh, learn about and see how it's going to work and implement it. Um, this is something that you know uh, we need to take it seriously because it's not a joke, basically. Our work with social media platform, it's not just, you know, a day or two or since the law became, you know, uh, it, came, it was imposed. We actually, this social media project has been making in years. In the past two years, we have been working continuously, you know, with the social media platforms to have this taken care of, you know, and, and stop the genocide denial on their platforms. However, you know, we're not the only ones. There's so many of people who are trying to have this done. Uh, but, you know, the responsibility of social media uh, companies is not as it seems to be, you know, what they are saying, you know, publicly. So, right. So what's however, next? So what's next? You know, what's next for so your institute? Next? You know, will what's you continue next? fight with Facebook? Will you continue demand from Facebook to, 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 to make some action finally? Yes, we will. It's not just the Facebook we have, you know, TikTok. We have other social media platforms that we're actually trying to, you know, work with. Uh, we, you know, at the Institute, we've been about 15 years volunteer work. None of us get paid or anything. We're sacrificing our time for the victims of Srebrenica and other uh, victims in from Bosnia and Herzegovina and other, other parts of the world. We actually have a few projects on that, too. But... Um, we are working to bring justice to the, uh, you know, to the victims of genocide. We have built a great relationship with the Canadian government, with other governments all around the world, um, uh, who like, uh, who are like us, who are eager to help the victims. But we are all, you know, kind of in this little bubble, not knowing what to do. And I think, you know, in Bosnia, this is a, a step forward, you know, with the law that uh, high, rep high representative just brought up about. So. We'll see how that goes, but we for sure will use it and, and, and fight for the, for the rights of the victims.
Right, Elena, thanks so much for being our guest. And I do want to congratulate you and your team in the Institute for um, finally uh, sorting these things out. And I hope your, your fight continues and I hope you will have more breakthroughs like the one you had with Google. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Alena Demirovic there. She's a Secretary General of the Institute for the Research of Genocide Canada. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans, the show dedicated to the people, places and stories of Southeastern Europe. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye for now.